Chapter 4 Trails Because the Dhamma is Sanditiko, experienced and understood within oneself alone, I did not talk to anyone about this incident in my meditation, not even Ajahn Kongma. I simply kept it to myself. I didn't tell Ajahn Kongma about the profound experiences that happened in my meditation, because I suspected he wouldn't take them seriously. After all, I was still a very junior monk at that time. I was reluctant to speak openly about my meditation in Saingam Forest Monastery. For I feared that talking about it would only lead to differences of opinion among the senior monks and give rise to unnecessary misunderstanding. Instead, my thoughts were drawn toward the venerable Ajahn Mond, whose great renown as a meditation teacher I had long been aware of. I'd heard about the extraordinary courage and determination he displayed in practicing the forest monk's way of life and the uncompromising strictness he used in teaching his disciples. I considered Ajahn Mond to be the highest authority on meditation. Although the Ajahns at Saingam Forest Monastery were disciples of Ajahn Mond, I was convinced it would be better to question the great master himself. Indeed, I felt sure that Ajahn Mond was the only person I could trust to interpret the significance of my recent meditation experience. I resolved to seek him out, prostrate myself at his feet, and request his guidance. I intended to tell him everything, beginning with the day I started meditating and continuing step by step up to the dramatic events I'd recently experienced in my body contemplation practice. I hoped to have him confirm my belief that my meditation was firmly on the right track. In December of 1939, I made the decision to take leave of Ajahn Gong Ma and make the long trek to the northern province of Chiang Mai, hoping to meet up with Ajahn Man there. When Ajahn Gong Ma learned that I intended to take his leave to search for Ajahn Man, he asked me in a very serious tone, Tanjia, how can a monk like you possibly stay with Ajahn Man? Did he really think I was that inept? Even if there was some truth in what Ajahn Gong Ma implied, I had no intention to abandon my resolve. I answered him as diplomatically as I could. Why is it wrong for me to go see a monk of such high virtue? A rough person like me needs to find a tough teacher to straighten him out. The venerable teachers here are certainly competent. I don't underestimate their ability. But continuing to stay at Saingam Forest Monastery means I'm living too close to home, too near family and friends. I need more seclusion from the distractions caused by their frequent visits. Living nearby, they can easily drop in and chat about whatever's on their minds. Friends and neighbors try to drag me into their worldly affairs, which makes it more difficult to focus on meditation practice. As soon as my mother heard that I planned to leave for Chiang Mai, she showed up and broke down in tears. Emotional outbursts like that disrupt my calm and concentration, which becomes very tiresome. I left the home life with all its worries and concerns in a deliberate attempt to pursue a life of renunciation. I now feel that facing the challenge of living far away from home will keep my mind sheltered from mundane concerns and greatly benefit my practice. That's why I humbly seek your approval. Ajahn Gongma's curt reply was, Well, Tanjia, if you learn something good up there in Chiang Mai, don't forget to come back down to enlighten us old folks, okay? Hearing the mocking tone in his voice, I thought, what, what the hell does that mean? And I became more determined than ever to leave. Somewhat annoyed, I stated my intentions very clearly. Permission or no permission, I'm going to Chiang Mai. Let Ajahn Mond be the one to judge whether or not I can stay with him. I felt that sure of myself at the time. After informing Ajahn Gong Ma of my intention to leave, I went to say goodbye to my parents and other relatives. I arrived home to find both my mother and my father crying. My mother pleaded with me tearfully, You've always been picky about food and so hard to feed. How can you even think about going on such a long and arduous journey, son? Of all her children, I was the one my mother had always loved the most, and her concern showed in the tears on her face. Eggs? Yeah, they're hard for me to eat. 
and that's why I have to go to Chiang Mai. I'll become so well-trained that eating eggs will be easy. There's no need to worry. I'm not going to die of starvation, Mom. I tried to calm my parents down and make them feel comfortable with my decision, because I did not want them to worry about me too much. As I headed out on the trek to Chiang Mai, I stopped at Ajahn Li's monastery to pay my respects. When I told him where I intended to go, his eyes lit up and his voice roared out, That's the way to do it. Go for it, Jia, like a disciple of the Buddha. He continued with some timely advice. Ajahn Mond is a truly great monk, so be careful to behave faultlessly in his presence. Stay vigilant and be sincere in your practice, otherwise you won't be able to stay with him for long. You can't fake it with Ajahn Mond, he will see through you straight away. Pay close attention to how he thinks, how he speaks, and how he behaves, and try to incorporate these factors into your Dhamma practice. In that way, you will stay on the Dhamma path that Ajahn Mond has blazed. Listening to Ajahn Li's instructions, my heart felt a surge of courage as I resolved to push forward in the quest to train under such a renowned arahant. My spirits were high as I prepared to take leave of Ajahn Li. As I rose to go, he pointed to the young monk seated beside him and said, Tan Jia, take my disciple Tan Fuang with you as a traveling companion. Should you encounter difficulties, you can help each other out. Ajahn Li then set our departure date to coincide with his, for he was soon to depart on a trip to India. A few days later, the three of us journeyed to Bangkok on a passenger steamer. As we were preparing to board the boat, my parents and relatives showed up to plead one last time for me to stay. With tearful faces, they crowded around me, trying to prevent me from going aboard. My older sister cried out, Monks can't carry money, they can't work for wages, so how will you survive? How will you manage to travel to Chiang Mai? I shot back, how do monks all over Thailand travel? How do they live? How do they eat? Well, that's exactly how I'm going to travel. That's exactly how I plan to live. The Buddha never had this much damn trouble when leaving the palace to become a monk. What a nuisance. Reacting to this outburst, my sister snatched the umbrella tent that I used to ward off mosquitoes when meditating and hid it from view. It was exasperating. By the time we were called to board the boat, she still hadn't returned it to me. Finally, I looked right at her and said, Okay, I guess I'll have to just damn well sleep without it and let the mosquitoes devour me. When my own family can't stop me from going, what makes you think that an umbrella tent or a horde of mosquitoes can? Once my sister realized how dogged my determination was, she relented and handed back the umbrella tent. Ajahn Li, Tan Fuang, and I then boarded the steamer to Bangkok without further incident. From Bangkok, Ajahn Li set out on his journey to India, the birthplace of the Buddha. He didn't fly to India or go by train. Instead, he hiked through wilderness areas until he reached the Burmese border and trekked all the way across Burma to arrive in India. Meanwhile, Tan Fuang and I resided in Bangkok for about three weeks before boarding an overnight train heading north to Chiang Mai. Upon our arrival, we went to stay at Chedi Luang Monastery in the city center. Somdet Maha Wirawong was the abbot, although at that time he had yet to be promoted to the title of Somdet. Hence, he was known to us simply as Ajahn Pim. He was young, and we had just met for the first time. Straight away, Ajahn Pim told me to spend the night in an underground passage beneath the ancient royal stupa at the center of the monastery. A tight corridor descending from a narrow aperture at the Chedi's base provided just enough space to lie down at the bottom. It turned out that this Chedi was considered to be the home of a very fierce demon. Right after I lay down to sleep, a huge black apparition appeared standing menacingly over me, one giant leg on each side. I quickly began repeating a protection verse that I knew by heart and then radiated thoughts of friendliness in all directions until my mind converged into deep meditation. By the time I withdrew from meditation, the demon had vanished. 
The next morning, the monks told me that everyone who had ventured to spend the night underneath that chedi became so terrified that they abandoned their attempts in the middle of the night. I was the only person they knew of who had spent an entire night there. Later, I found out that the demon had departed the chedi that night and never returned to frighten the monks again. That demon and I must have shared some karmic relationship in our past life history for my presence to have had such an effect on it. Tan Fuang and I resided at Chedi Luang Monastery for only a short time before moving on in search of Ajahn Mon. In hopes of picking up clues about his whereabouts, we set out on foot heading in the direction of Changdao. Finding no word of him there, we proceeded west through mountains and valleys, hiking and camping along winding forest trails until we reached Prao District. While camping there, we asked the village folk living in the surrounding area if they knew where we could find Ajahn Mun. Not surprisingly, the hill tribe people of northern Thailand spoke their own dialects that neither Tan Fuang nor I understood. It was quite frustrating, really. The villagers kept repeating something that sounded like To Ao Yong Ga, but we had no idea what that meant. They obviously couldn't understand the questions we asked them either. Finally, I threw up my hands and shouted, To! Your mother's one too! And walked off. Fortunately, they didn't catch my meaning. The journey to find Ajahn Mon in the northern wilderness was the most arduous and exhausting endeavor I'd ever undertaken. It was the first time that I'd walked long distances barefoot on rugged dirt trails that never seemed to reach a satisfactory destination. My feet were blistered and raw, my body became so weak that I had only my inner strength to carry me through. As I struggled with hardships day after day, my thoughts were constantly drawn toward Ajahn Mand and the refuge that he embodied. Dragging my body through long hours of pain and fatigue, I beseeched Ajahn Mand to rescue me from my plight. Ajahn Mand, where are you? Help me, please. I'm nearly dead from exhaustion. I've heard you can know the hearts and minds of others. Are you aware that Tan Jia is coming to see you? His body is worn out and ready to collapse. He no longer knows how he got here or where he should be going. Where are you, Ajahn Mon? If you are aware of this appeal to your kind heart, please send someone to come and fetch me before I die along the way. This plea ran through my mind many times a day while I pushed ahead in my search for Ajahn Mon. Sometimes I whispered it under my breath. Sometimes I spoke it out loud. But I never gave up my resolve. I never let thoughts of defeat creep in. Whatever the toll on my body, I was determined to continue the search until my last breath. I believed I must meet him to tell him about my meditation experiences. I wanted to hear his verdict. If I failed to find him in Prow District, so be it. I'd continue trekking from one northern district to another until I tracked him down. As long as I kept body and mind together, I was sure to find him in the end. My commitment to overcoming all obstacles in my path was just incredible. And to think that before I became a monk, I had no interest in religious matters at all. I would turn my back and walk away every time a monk gave a Dhamma talk. I couldn't be bothered to listen— but now look at me. I'd walk to the end of the earth to hear Ajahn Mond speak. I was that eager to find a trusted authority who could confirm that I was not crazy, that the Dhamma I had realized was the kind of Dhamma that people trapped in a web of craving and delusion could never comprehend. Only a fully awakened Arahant could verify the attainment of that Dhamma, the value of which transcends all heavenly and earthly treasures. Thinking like this put a bounce in my step as I forged ahead with my pilgrimage. Shortly thereafter, Tan Fuang and I happened upon a small village settlement called Man Khoi. There we met a man who told us that Ajahn Mon was residing in an old abandoned monastery nearby. This welcome news lifted my spirits and whetted my appetite to hear his teachings to such an extent that concerns about hunger, thirst, and exhaustion vanished. 
Tan Fuang and I hurried on our way and were soon standing at the monastery gate. Finding the gate open, we strode in to look around. Inside the monastery grounds, we saw several small, grass-roofed huts with split bamboo floors and walls made of bamboo latticework packed with leaves. The grounds were swept so neatly that I thought the monastery was bound to house a sizable community of monks. As I walked up to the first hut, I spied an old monk sitting on a small bamboo platform wearing his upper robe with the right shoulder bare, as though he were patiently waiting for someone to show up. A man of small stature with dark, tanned skin. He looked up inquisitively but said nothing when I approached. It was the bold, majestic appearance that gave him away. It must certainly be Ajahn Mon. Who else could it be? He must have known already that I was coming to see him. That's why he's sitting here waiting. I showed up without any advance notice, but he already knew. Certain I faced Ajahn Mon, I dropped to my knees on the bare ground and bowed deeply three times at his feet, thinking how rare it was to meet a man who knows the events of past and future, who knows in advance who's coming in and who's going out. After my prostrations, he asked me, where are you from? I'm from Chantaburi. I've lived with Ajahn Gong Ma and Ajahn Li. Aha! Tan Li and Tan Gong Ma, right? They're my disciples. He said this in such a way that I felt he knew my background, where I'd come from, and why I was there. Later, when an opportunity arose, I briefly described my meditation experience to him. I practiced body contemplation until body and mind separated and everything disappeared. I probed deeply to investigate every aspect of the body in meticulous detail. I searched carefully and methodically, part by part, layer by layer, until, in a moment of wonder, the whole physical universe tore apart and dropped away from the mind, leaving in place only the mind's natural state of knowing the truth in harmony with Dhamma. Alone on its own, totally devoid of worldly impact, the awareness itself shone bright and clear. Absolutely nothing made contact with it. A feeling of being centered in this clear brightness expanded until eventually all sense of bodily awareness disappeared. Only clear, pure awareness remained. The mind stayed absorbed in this serene state of deep samadhi for many hours. Even though the awareness felt intensely single-minded, it seemed almost as if the mindful focus I had cultivated for so long suddenly lacked its usual concentration. But it was just a case where the entire physical world had vanished from awareness. Only an indescribable purity of mind remained, just the true knowing mind, without a trace of blemish. Sitting quietly as he listened, Ajahn Mon did not object to my account. I then asked how I should proceed, what I should do next. He replied, Continue with the same practice. That's good already. Just keep striving until you finish the job. His answer was very brief, but I felt gratified knowing I was on the right path. Those who have never seriously practiced body contemplation fail to realize how much the physical body is a source of various afflictions and attachments, which in turn cause constant frustration and anxiety in life. So long as the mind remains focused on external bodily appearances, it won't be able to free itself from pain and suffering. However, when attention is directed inside the body, the cause of the problem starts to become apparent because mindful attention guards against the intrusion of external distractions. Whether doing walking or sitting meditation, always hold the mind's attention within the body's physical frame. Don't let it stray from the constraints of mindfulness. Mindfulness is essential because it keeps awareness grounded in the present moment. Mindfulness provides the information needed for wisdom to investigate the body. Because it is constantly aware of what occurs moment to moment, mindfulness is the mental faculty that gathers the necessary investigative data. It outlines the boundaries of the mind's perceptions. 
through detached observation, a clear mental picture emerges to serve as a basis for in-depth examination. In this way, mindfulness is the foundation of every meditative investigation. Repeatedly contemplating with mindfulness and wisdom helps to weaken mental hindrances and free the mind from sensual attachment to the body. As the mind's preoccupation with the physical body decreases, it begins to shine forth with greater concentration and clarity. With increased clarity comes heightened understanding. Strong concentration allows wisdom to reach deeply and remove mental defilements through profound insights. To accomplish this, each part of the body must be examined until it appears clearly to the mind as repugnant, unsatisfactory, ever-changing, and not self. In truth, the Buddha encouraged his disciples to clearly comprehend how everything in the body is subject to change, that no inherent self can be found there, and that no bodily experience will ever lead to full and lasting happiness. When the investigation reaches this level, wisdom separates the mind from the body until the mind eventually becomes detached forever from the belief that the body is oneself. Upon reaching this level, the mind passes beyond bodily desires with no lingering attachments. After receiving assurances from Ajahn Mand that my practice was on the right track, I bowed gratefully at his feet three times, retired to the hut assigned to me, put my bowl and robes away, and bathed at the well. I rejoined Ajahn Mand that evening to ask dependence from him as my teacher, an observance strictly followed by forest monks. He agreed to my request, which meant that he accepted me as a disciple like a father would a son. I was now his burden, for it was his responsibility to train and instruct me in the Buddha's way of practice. But the burden was shared, for it was now my responsibility to trust in Ajahn Mond's instructions and to serve faithfully as his personal attendant. Thus began a four-year relationship of devotion and practice. In his wisdom, the Buddha established this practice of mutual dependence to ensure that junior monks receive proper discipline and guidance when they join the Sangha. A junior monk of five reigns retreats or fewer is required to live in dependence under the supervision of an experienced senior monk. If the dependency lapses because the student is separated from his teacher overnight, the junior monk must request dependency anew upon his return. Even if a newly ordained monk is exceptionally learned and skilled in both the ways of the world and of Dhamma, he is not exempt from this obligation. The Buddha did allow exceptions to this rule for the following cases. A junior monk who has yet to find a monastery to start his training. A monk in the middle of a long-distance journey. A monk laid up with a serious illness or serving as another monk's nurse. And a monk camped temporarily in the wilderness to accelerate his meditation. However, such monks were advised to bear in mind that whenever they encountered a worthy teacher, they must continue the five-year dependency with him and fulfill their responsibility to the end. This was the correct attitude to have. A monk who has fulfilled his five-year obligation but has yet to reach ten years as a trainee is considered an intermediate monk. He is expected to have sufficient knowledge and experience to hold his own in the Dhamma and Vinaya practices, thus making him capable of living and practicing on his own. For this reason, the Buddha gave intermediate monks who were deemed competent permission to excuse themselves from their apprenticeships to go live by themselves. In other words, they have faith in the Buddha, Dhamma, and Sangha, possess energy and mindfulness, and feel fear and dread of bad behavior. They must have right view concerning moral virtue and be well-versed in Dhamma teachings and the ways of wisdom. In addition to that, they should know what is and what is not an offense of the Vinaya monastic rules as well as which are considered minor offenses, and which are grave offenses. They should also have correctly committed the entire Patimokkha to memory. Intermediate monks who possess the above qualities are permitted to stay and meditate alone. However, they are not supposed to mentor other monks by setting themselves up as teachers. On the other hand, intermediate monks who lack sufficient knowledge and understanding to depend on themselves 
must continue taking dependence from the teacher even after they've completed a five-year training period. Ajahn Mond instructed me at length about the monastic duties and responsibilities that make up the code of behavior expected from members of a forest monastic community. Learning these duties is especially important for junior monks because it allows them to integrate quickly into the established routine of the monastery. In the Pali language, these duties are called vata. These specifics of monastic behavior, which are detailed in the Vinaya texts, form an integral part of the customs and traditions practiced by forest monks in Thailand. As such, they play a central and practical role in the daily life of a forest monastery. The main objective of practicing this code of behavior is the cultivation of mindfulness and wisdom in a monk's everyday chores. With increased focus on routine tasks comes a heightened attention to detail. Because the number of details regulating nearly every aspect of monastic life is extensive, a monk undergoing the training, especially a junior one, must pay close attention to everything he does from morning to evening. This degree of attention requires mindfulness to always be aware of what's happening, to recall what action is appropriate for that situation, and to act on it in a timely manner. Such attentiveness demands diligence and energy. Diligence counteracts the tendency to do things half-heartedly or in a sloppy way. Monks who perform their daily chores to perfection are called achara sampano, meaning they exhibit flawless conduct. Mostly, Ajahn Mon directed his remarks specifically to my situation as a junior monk, explaining how I was expected to fulfill my obligation to serve as his personal attendant. Every morning just after dawn, I was to take his bowl, sitting cloth, and shoulder bag from his hut, carry them to the main meeting hall, and set up his seat there by arranging his sitting cloth, lap cloth, face cloth, cup, tooth sticks, and other requisites. I had to check to make sure the water kettle was full of fresh, clean water and that a clean spittoon was placed beside it. It was also my responsibility to sweep and clean his hut every morning before alms round. Ajahn Mun taught that junior monks should show respect to senior teachers by bowing to them at the appropriate times, by rising to greet them when they arrive, by holding their hands in Anjali when speaking to them, and by performing other duties of respect. His advice for the monks in training with him was practical. A junior monk still under dependence must ask permission from the abbot before going to the village or traveling to another location. To go without asking permission or to go after being denied permission is an offense against the disciplinary code. A junior monk is expected to leave decisions about travel up to his teacher's discretion. Likewise, a junior monk should avoid associating with people outside the monastery in such a way as to cause mistrust and suspicion. He should avoid engaging in unseemly behavior which might reflect badly on his teacher. He should try to behave as though he were always in his teacher's presence. When alone, he can imagine that his teacher is present and ask himself, How would I behave if he were here watching me? A junior monk should always walk a few paces behind his teacher and never interrupt him when he is speaking. Should his teacher misspeak, he shouldn't correct him publicly, but instead wait for an opportunity to mention it privately. Also, a junior monk is responsible for taking care of his teacher when he is sick and should not leave his side until he either recovers from illness or passes away. Ajahn Mond directed me to take special care of my requisites, be they personal possessions, like the bowl and the robes, or something which belongs to the Sangha, like buildings, books, or tools, in such a way as to make them last as long as possible. Taking a good look at monastic discipline, I saw that the entire code of conduct was about training the heart to be self-sacrificing, humble, and free from blemish. Ajahn Mond pressed me to carry this diligent attitude into my meditation practice. His message was loud and clear. Whether walking for alms, sweeping the grounds, sewing or dyeing robes, eating a meal, washing a bowl, or simply stretching my legs— Mindfulness must be maintained at every waking moment and in all activities. 
His advice for me concerning rest was meant for serious practitioners. Take a break only when it's time to sleep, then resolve to get up immediately as soon as you awaken. The moment you wake up, rise quickly, wash your face with cold water, and resume your meditation. If you still feel sleepy, practice walking meditation, striding briskly back and forth to dispel the drowsiness. Sit down to meditate only when all drowsiness has dissipated. Invigorated by the power of Ajahn Mond's teaching, I spent the next several months making an all-out effort in every aspect of monastic practice. But when the more temperate climate of the rainy season abruptly ended and the cold, windy nights set in, I struggled to stay warm, and my concentration suffered. I had only thin cotton robes to wrap around me, which left me shivering at the mercy of the elements. The walls and roof of the bamboo platform where I slept were made of dried banana leaves, which afforded just enough protection to keep out the morning dew, but not enough to protect from the cold. One night, as I lay on that platform, shaking uncontrollably and unable to fall asleep, I wondered how my companion Tan Fuang was coping with the northern climate. I walked quietly to his platform and whispered ever so softly to him, Fuang, it's so damn cold. Let's just go back home. I said this not because I intended to give up and leave, but because I wanted to gauge his mood, see how he'd respond, what he was thinking. He remained silent and still, and in the silence, I knew that he was as determined as I was to stick it out, no matter the hardship. At dawn the next morning, when it was light enough to make out the lines on the palm of my hand, I left the small platform where I stayed and walked quickly to a small bamboo hut that served as the dining hall. The moment I entered and looked up, Ajahn Mond's eyes struck me like a thunderbolt. You people from the southern seashore don't have any tolerance for pain. Get out. Go. No one invited you to come here. His voice roared as fiercely as a tiger ready to pounce. Small kitten that I was, I crouched down in fear. My legs suddenly went numb. I couldn't move. Ajahn Mond could read my mind. He knew everything. That was a scary thought. From then on, I knew I had to be extremely careful with my thoughts and my speech in his presence. Because Ajahn Mond was an arahant, the consequences of my negligence could be severe. After composing myself, I took a tentative step and very humbly began doing my morning duties. Those few words from Ajahn Mond really caught my attention. I felt as though I'd come under his spell because I followed his example in everything I did. I cautioned myself to be careful. Ajahn Mond was the real thing. After that incident, he treated me kindly. He asked me to help him in various ways, and I kept close to him and took good care of him. I gradually became more familiar with his methods and felt more comfortable in his presence. Back then, I was still young and strong, but I worried about Ajahn Mond's health. He was almost seventy years old and so thin that his skin had shrunken around the bones, making him appear frail and sickly. But then again, when we walked together, his quick movements surprised me. When I walked with him through the forest, his pace was so fast that I could hardly keep up with him on the trails. He easily walked all day, and when dusk turned to night, he just kept right on going. Despite his age, Ajahn Mond went entirely without food on some days. He subsisted solely on tea and water. As a result, he grew even thinner. His gaunt appearance worried me so much that I occasionally pleaded with him to eat some food. He'd usually grunt and say, It's none of your business. I'd press him further, Come on, please eat something. To which he'd shoot back, Leave me alone, don't bother me. Exasperated, I'd blurt out, Good grief! How can someone be born a human being and not want to eat food? Then he would respond more forcefully, Go away. Leave me alone. It's my business, not yours. Ajahn Mond scolded me like that every time I brought up his fasting. After Tan Fuang happened to overhear one of these heated discussions, he caught up with me as I walked away and asked why I was so intent on provoking Ajahn Mond. Wasn't I afraid of his scolding? 
Tan Fuang was obviously terrified, but I told him that if I didn't provoke a John Mon, we wouldn't hear such good teachings. Later, Ajahn Mon scolded Tan Fuang because he disagreed with the way Ajahn Mon took palm sugar as a medicinal in the afternoon. Every morning on alms round in the village, someone placed a small piece of palm sugar in Ajahn Mon's bowl. Since it was wrapped up tightly, the piece of sugar did not make direct contact with the food items in the bowl. Upon returning to the monastery, Ajahn Mond had a monk put the sugar aside for use with his afternoon tea. According to monastic rules, if the lump of sugar contained traces of food, its consumption in the afternoon would not be allowed. Ajahn Mond was always scrupulous in making this distinction. But Tan Fuang mistakenly thought that he had violated a rule of conduct and made comments to that effect behind his back. In the afternoon, after having a monk break the sugar lump into small pieces, Ajahn Mon would place a piece in his mouth and then follow it with three sips of tea. He would repeat this several more times and then stop, leaving half the sugar uneaten. Ajahn Mon confronted the monks at a group meeting that night. His eyes flared and his tone of voice was menacing as he spoke. Which one of you wants to challenge me? Huh? Somebody here tried to hit me on the head with a rule book. He thinks I'm a fool. Who is it? A John Mond had already seen into the mind of the guilty party and knew who he was. There were not many of us present, so we also knew the culprit. After the meeting, we discussed the Vinaya issue among ourselves in some depth. In the end, Tan Fuang admitted the fault was his and went straight away to apologize and ask A John Mond's forgiveness. Following that, Ajahn Mond never mentioned this matter again. But our respect for his mental skills increased, and we were much more cautious and circumspect about what we thought and how we behaved from then on. I often recalled what Ajahn Li told me before I left Chantaburi. So, you think you can live with Ajahn Mond, eh? Then be careful, because he will know everything that's going on in your mind. If you do stay with him... Don't act in any way to spoil my good reputation. Despite the hardships I endured, I felt extremely fortunate to have the opportunity to live and practice in the presence of a monk like Ajahn Mon, who was faultless both in realization of the Dhamma and adherence to the Vinaya. From an ordinary person's perspective, living on a wind-blown platform in a remote wilderness location and eating one meal a day is bound to be torture but the setting was just right for a monk intent on liberation. Dang Forest Monastery, where Ajahn Monde resided, was situated in a small clearing surrounded by a landscape of forests and mountains stretching to the horizon in all directions. Its resident monks relied on the inhabitants of a nearby six-house village settlement for their daily alms, food, and other simple requisites. Owing to their faith in Ajahn Mond, the villagers had fashioned the hut in which he lived out of local materials. With a frame constructed of bamboo posts and a floor of flattened bamboo strips, the hut had walls and a roof covered with large overlapping banana leaves for protection against the weather. The monastery provided a place of ideal seclusion for forest monks to practice. At the same time, the power of Ajahn Mond's virtuous attainments and accumulated merit was so strong that his presence acted like a magnet drawing people of faith to him. The longer he resided at Dang Forest Monastery, the more his exalted reputation spread to people living far and wide in that area. Consequently, people were willing to travel long distances just to meet him and pay their respects. Although well-intentioned on their part, Intrusions of this kind were unwelcome disruptions to his daily practice. This inevitably meant that Ajahn Mon would not remain very long in one location. Having a character shaped by the practice of Dhamma and Vinaya, he was not willing to compromise the strictness of his principles simply to satisfy the wishes of his devotees. The same strict attitude applied to the way in which Ajahn Mon managed affairs inside the monastery. For instance, one day the monastery's female lay attendant, who walked from the village every morning to offer food to him, 
arrived carrying several small mango seedlings, which she proceeded to plant near his hut. He immediately asked what she was doing. She replied that she was planting mango trees for the monks so that when they eventually bore fruit, the monks would have mangoes to eat. She considered this idea very practical. Seeing the matter differently, Ajahn Mon raised his voice and scolded her. Who do you think I am? You misunderstand my purpose here. I came to this monastery to find seclusion from the outside world. My sole purpose is to practice the Dhamma that transcends mundane concerns. I didn't come here with the intention to settle down and cultivate fruit trees and vegetables to supplement my diet. Don't you realize that you're bringing me a load of trouble? Do you expect me to sit here and grow old looking after these mango trees? This incident pointed to another reason why Ajahn Mon never stayed in one location for very long. Always acting with discretion, he was very circumspect in the way he practiced the monk's life. He refrained altogether from involvement in worldly matters. Even small matters that most people would consider insignificant received his full attention. He didn't get carried away with popular trends in society. He saw them for what they were, distractions from the true purpose of monastic living. He believed that monks, whose livelihood depends on the generosity of others, have an obligation to earnestly focus on Dhamma rather than directing their attention to common lay practices. He believed in a strict division of labor between the monks and laity, which he felt accorded with the spirit of the monastic discipline set out by the Buddha. In fact, the Buddha's rules for monastic conduct clearly state that a monk violates the disciplinary code if he himself plants fruit trees and flowering plants, has someone do it for him, or if he places flowers in pots for decoration. The Buddha criticized all such activities as inappropriate behavior that leads to a decline in monastic standards. During his lifetime, if a monk committed even a minor transgression of the rules, the Buddha asked his great disciples, Venerable Sariputta and Venerable Mogalana, to discipline the offender on his behalf. If that monk refused to obey their instructions, they had the Buddha's permission to penalize him according to the severity of the offense. The Buddha stipulated that the Sangha was responsible for reprimanding and punishing those monks whose harmful behavior adversely affected the community, especially in the case where recalcitrant monks refused to change their ways. The Buddha realized that if he did not establish a means to address such disobedience, it would soon become a chronic problem leading to disharmony within the Sangha. The history of Dang Forest Monastery stretches back centuries. Early ethnic Mon inhabitants of the area built the monastery in the middle of a dense rosewood forest. The site was later abandoned and fell into ruin, as evidenced by the broken bricks and clay tiles scattered around the compound, the only remains of a fabled past. In his wanderings through the north, Ajahn Mon discovered this ancient site and decided to settle there for a while. The forest setting provided a naturally quiet and secluded retreat environment, conducive to a life of meditation. Despite his reclusive nature, Ajahn Mon attracted a large following of disciples willing to endure the hardships of life in the wilderness to study with him. During Ajahn Mon's sojourn at Dang Forest Monastery, Many disciples traveled on foot from as far away as central and northeast Thailand to listen to his teaching and receive his training. Ajahn Tate, Ajahn Prom, Ajahn Kao, and Ajahn Fun are a few examples. To reach him, they had to hike for days along narrow trails in the remote wilderness regions that separated Thailand's north from the rest of the country. Regions where the population was sparse and village settlements were so far apart that it often took a whole day to walk from one to the next. These indomitable monks endured rain and cold, hunger and thirst, and the ever-present danger of tigers and elephants to learn at the feet of the great master. Many of the monks who trained directly under his guidance have distinguished themselves by their attainments in Dhamma. Eventually becoming well-known teachers, they've passed on his distinctive teaching methods to their disciples in a forest monastic lineage that extends to the present day. 
Ajahn Mond's teaching style was very practical and down-to-earth. It was conveyed to us less through lofty discourses, though these were very inspiring, than through his exemplary actions and the force of his personality. As Ajahn Mahabua has clearly described in two classic books, Venerable Ajahn Mond Buridatta Tara, A Spiritual Biography, and Patipada, Venerable Ajahn Mond's Path of Practice. As for me, I gained practical knowledge mostly by observing how he behaved and trying to emulate it, rather than by simply listening to him speak and trying to process that information intellectually. By temperament, I have always placed more emphasis on doing than on speaking. I prefer to put all my effort into getting things done, as I'm not very skilled at talking, writing, or memorizing long Dhamma passages. Ajahn Mond's ability to be a living, practicing example of what he taught was one of the traits that most impressed me about the training I received with him. Instead of just teaching verbal knowledge, he wanted to place me in situations that would force me to develop the qualities of mind and character which I needed to survive my battle with the defilements. For instance, Ajahn Mond always stressed the importance of good moral conduct for monks, how we speak and how we behave. He explained that moral discipline is the gateway to the path that leads to an enlightened mind and the cornerstone on which all genuine progress in meditation rests. Unless monks are principled in their conduct, taking their precepts seriously and practicing them strictly, they will not be able to live this life of renunciation for long. A monk lacking moral virtue is like a human body with a defective organ that can't function properly or perform its obligations for the welfare of the whole body. The more moral handicaps a monk has, the more apathetic he is toward Dhamma practice. On the other hand, those monks whose moral standards are high and whose conduct is unblemished should not become complacent. Their moral standard can be raised even higher, and their virtue can become even purer by concentrating on being satisfied with little, being easy to care for, being calm and serene, being free of defilements, being inquisitive and energetic, and being refined in manner and character. All these factors will contribute to the perfection of monastic discipline, which makes a monk inclined to join the noble lineage of the Arahants. These refinements of a monk's conduct are covered extensively in the thirteen traditional dutangas, or ascetic practices, initiated by the Buddha. Practices like living off alms food, wearing robes made of discarded rags, living in the forest, and eating only one meal a day. These and other dutangas are austere trainings designed to aid in the elimination of defilements from the mind, and thus serve as powerful means to advance meditation practice. Their primary aim is to pressure the practitioner to see the inherent danger of attachment to insubstantial things, such as the physical body and perceptions of the eight worldly concerns, pleasure and pain, gain and loss, praise and blame, fame and disrepute. Practiced with diligence, the Dutangas reduce troubling weaknesses like excessive eating, preoccupation with clothing, laziness, attachment to comfort, and restlessness. A monk who practices the Dutangas must be willing to put his life on the line and, if necessary, sacrifice his life to attain the fruits of the practice. When he makes a solemn resolve to observe a certain practice, he should never back down, never give up. It is therefore advisable for him to choose the Dutangas that are suitable to his own character and temperament, it's not necessary to practice them all. He can simply select the ones that are best suited to his needs from the following Dutanga practices. Wearing only robes made from discarded cloth is a Dutanga observance that Ajahn Mon practiced routinely. This ascetic practice counters the desire to wear fine, attractive-looking robes and other personal items. It's practiced by searching for large and small pieces of cloth which have been thrown away because they are no longer useful, then washing and stitching the pieces together to make a usable garment, such as an upper robe, a lower robe, an outer robe, a bathing cloth, or any other cloth requisite. 
Such cloth may be found discarded on the ground at cremation sites, along roadways, in alleyways, or at public dumps. That is, any cloth that is obviously ownerless. It may be torn, burned, frayed, or gnawed by animals then cast aside as rubbish. It might even be soiled with human waste or other dirty stains. In other words, worthless old rags are collected here and there, one piece at a time, and put away until a full robe can be sewn from them. The difference between this ascetic practice and a monk's normal practice is that monks' robes are usually cut and sewn from bolts of new, store-bought cloth offered for that purpose by lay supporters. The main benefit of this ascetic practice is that it counters thoughts of pride and self-importance. A practicing monk must never allow pride to usurp the virtues he cultivates within his heart. Instead, he should train himself to assume the self-effacing attitude of living as a worthless old rag by never allowing conceit about his worthiness to come up. Ajahn Mund believed that the practice of wearing robes made from discarded old rags was an excellent way to reduce feelings of self-importance. Wearing only the three principal robes is a Dutanga practice that Ajahn Mond observed faithfully from the day he ordained until he reached old age. In those days, Dutanga monks wandered through forests and mountains, traveling by foot the whole way. Because each monk carried his own belongings, he took with him only what was truly essential. A monk's three principal robes, the lower robe, the upper robe, and the outer robe, were all that he needed to protect himself from sun, wind, and rain, and thus to live in relative comfort. Extra robes were often an unnecessary indulgence. Choosing the Dutanga practice of using only three robes fostered contentment with little, and allowed a monk to travel in a light and carefree manner like a bird on the wing. Should he be given something extra, he would simply pass it on to another monk to avoid accumulating unnecessary possessions. Walking on alms round every day is a Dutanga observance that, as an ascetic practice, directs a monk to walk from the monastery to a village community to collect alms food every day without fail. A Dutanga monk chooses to make the effort to meet faithful donors in their own communal setting for their spiritual benefit, rather than sitting back lazily waiting for the villagers to come to serve him in the monastery for his benefit. A lazy monk easily becomes spoiled when his needs are kindly attended to. A Dutanga monk, however, harbors no such expectations. He is intent on receiving food in his bowl at the homes of his donors as a way of benefiting them by giving each of them the opportunity to make merit for their long-term well-being. Ajahn Mon believed this practice should be treated as a sacred duty that calls for serious reflection each time a monk prepares to go on his morning alms round. He viewed alms round as an aspect of meditation practice during which each monk should endeavor to be mindful and remain properly restrained in body, speech, and mind. He stressed that mindfulness should be present in every movement and every thought, at every step on the route. Omitting no house on alms round while walking in the village each morning to collect food for the day is another Dutanga ascetic practice. A Dutanga monk does not choose to frequent only wealthy households that offer better food, nor does he favor the homes of his relatives or special supporters. He stops in front of every house on his route, even in front of those where he is unlikely to receive any food at all. He doesn't choose the houses where he'd prefer to go and avoid those he'd prefer not to. He accepts whatever is offered at each stop with a clear mind, unsullied by sensual desire. He trains himself to be contented with whatever food is placed in his bowl, whether it is tasty or tasteless, crude or refined, day-old or freshly cooked, separately wrapped or ladled in, or offered with clean hands or dirty ones. In each case, his demeanor remains calm and composed. Eating only one meal a day is an ascetic practice that is ideal for the meditative lifestyle of a Dutanga monk.
This practice helps support the work of meditation, as eating too much food can make the mind sluggish and dull. This Dutanga observance is an especially useful means of curtailing the greedy mentality of a practicing monk who tends to be infatuated with food. Unrestrained by a single meal, he could easily become more concerned about the food he puts in his stomach than he is about the fruits of his meditation. The rules for this ascetic practice stipulate that a monk's daily ration of food must all be eaten in one sitting. As soon as he rises from his seat, his meal for the day is over, even if food remains in his bowl. Eventually, even more stringent variations to the main rule were added. In the first variation, a monk consumes only the amount of food that is in his bowl when he begins to eat, regardless of how little that may be, and refuses to accept more food before he gets up from his seat. In the second variation, a monk is allowed to receive more food so long as some food still remains in his bowl. In the third, most lenient variation, a monk can continue to receive and consume more food provided he remains seated. Eating food only from the alms bowl is an ascetic practice whereby a Dutanga monk eats all food directly from his alms bowl, using his fingers to pick up each morsel and put it in his mouth. He abstains entirely from using utensils such as dishes, cups, or spoons while eating the meal. Every type of food, whether savory, salty, sour, or sweet, is placed together in the one vessel, where the flavors are bound to mix together. At a minimum level of strictness, different classes of food can be separated and kept apart. In a stricter practice, different types of food contact one another at the bottom of the bowl. With the strictest version of this practice, a Dutanga monk deliberately mixes together all varieties of food, using his hand to combine them into a hodgepodge of contrasting flavors and textures. Consequently, eating directly from the alms bowl is an excellent practice for freeing the mind from infatuation with the taste of food. Combining the taste and feel of food together in one bowl is an effective means to undercut desire for the taste of food and remove greed from a monk's mind as he eats his meal. A Dutanga monk cultivates the awareness that food's real purpose is to nourish the body, allowing it to remain healthy enough to continue his meditative lifestyle from one day to the next. In this way, neither the pleasant flavor of preferred foods nor the unpleasant flavor of disagreeable ones, will cause mental disturbance that might prompt a monk's mind to waver. At the same time, eating all food directly from the alms bowl without using any other utensils is a practice suited to the ascetic lifestyle of a Dutanga monk who aims to be content with little. Using just his alms bowl is a valuable practice for a monk wishing to unburden himself of concerns about having to carry extra utensils and look after them. Eating only the food collected on alms round is the Dutanga monk's practice of eating only that food which is received in the alms bowl on a monk's daily alms round, while declining food that is offered later back at the monastery. A Dutanga monk eats whatever food is offered into his bowl, never feeling anxious or upset should it fail to meet expectations. He regards the food he receives in his bowl each day to be enough for his needs, regardless of how much or how little he is offered. Anxiety about food is a characteristic of hungry ghosts who are tormented by the harrowing results of their own bad kama. Instead, the Dutanga monk cultivates contentment with little, and thus he is easily satisfied. The ascetic practice of refusing to accept any food offered after returning from alms round is a good method for countering the tendency to be greedy for food. It is also effective in reducing a monk's expectations concerning food and in eliminating the anxiety these expectations create. Living in the forest is an ascetic practice that stands at the heart of all the Dutanga observances. The Buddha bestowed high praise on monks who undertook this practice. 
In the Pali discourses, the Buddha often instructed his disciples to seek out the seclusion of forest dwellings as they were the most favorable places for purifying the mind of all defilements. Many of his greatest disciples, including Venerable Anya Kondanya and Venerable Maha Kasapa, were strict forest dwellers who maintained an austere, renunciant lifestyle their entire lives. The practices of those early forest monks epitomized the Buddha's teachings and exemplified his path to liberation. Buddhist monks who have chosen to undertake this Dutanga practice have gained many advantages from living in the forest. Meditating in a forest environment, a monk is more likely to attain those concentrated samadhi states he has yet to attain and maintain those he has already attained. Dwelling in the wilderness, with its austere and dangerous conditions, provides an excellent place for training the mind to overcome fear and dread. Because a Dutanga monk lives entirely out of doors at the mercy of changes in the weather, he develops a deep appreciation of the changing nature of all conditions. His daily life unfolds within an environment of forests and mountains, rivers and streams, caves, overhanging cliffs, and the presence of wild animals, which he sees as his equals in birth, aging, sickness, and death. Meditating in the natural surroundings of a forest environment awakens his senses and encourages mindfulness to remain vigilant in all his daily activities. Living in the seclusion of forests and mountains offers the Dutanga monk a calm, quiet environment for meditation, far removed from the distracting sights and sounds of crowded places. The seclusion experienced living in wilderness areas allows him to go beyond an intellectual understanding of the teaching and experience the true nature of what the Buddha taught. And living in the forest is the one ascetic practice that sets the stage for the other twelve Dutanga practices by providing them fertile ground in which to take root and flourish. Dwelling at the foot of a tree as a Dutanga observance closely resembles the ascetic practice of living in the forest. It differs in that a monk refrains from lodging in the relative safety of a bamboo platform or a crude hut and instead reaps the benefits of choosing the foot of a tree, usually a large, majestic one with a broad base and abundant shade, as a temporary lodging. He resolves to sit and sleep on the ground, using leaves and moss for cushioning. The tree's canopy becomes his roof. While providing some protection against the onslaughts of inclement weather, the tree also acts as an ideal location to firmly center his mind on the four foundations of mindfulness and the four noble truths, meditations which constitute his most effective defense against the inner onslaughts of mental defilements. Being constantly vulnerable to the threat posed by wild animals, forces a monk to rely on the power of his meditation to protect him from imminent danger by establishing a firm inner refuge in the mind. Monks and forests have coexisted in harmony since the time of the Buddha, when his disciples regularly retreated into the depths of the forests and mountains in search of physical isolation to aid them in the development of meditation and realization of the truth of the Buddha's teachings. The Buddha himself was born in a forest grove, he attained enlightenment at the foot of the Bodhi tree, and he passed into Parinibbana between a pair of Sal trees. The Buddha frequently dwelt in forests, both during his spiritual quest and after his enlightenment. Not all forest locations were deemed suitable for ascetic practice, however. The Buddha discouraged monks from living under trees that bordered a property line, trees located at a pilgrimage site, fruit-bearing trees, flowering trees, resinous, sappy trees, trees occupied by bats, or trees growing in the middle of a monastery compound. Being inconvenient for calm and seclusion, these places should be avoided. Living under the open sky is the ascetic practice whereby a Dutanga monk resides in an area out in the open, like a meadow or a woodland clearing, away from the canopy and shelter of trees found in forests and mountains. A makeshift cover fashioned from a monk's robes and a patchwork of large leaves can be put up in the middle of a clearing. 
Other less strict forms of this Dutanga observance include living under the shade of boulders, under the covering of bushes and shrubs, under the protection of overhanging cliffs, or in a deserted shack in a rice field. Living in wide and open spaces that integrate simplicity, quietude, and natural beauty offers monks an abode conducive to pleasant, peaceful abiding and deep meditative concentration. The monk who adopts this Dutanga practice lives free of the responsibility to keep his lodging neat and tidy. Instead, he simply defers to the natural world's prevailing order. When on the move, he feels light-hearted and confident, knowing that he can stop and rest anywhere along his journey and expect to have the stars as his ceiling and the moon as his lamplight. This prospect energizes a Dutanga monk, helping him dispel drowsiness, laziness, and boredom on a long trek. Invigorated by this freedom, he finds it convenient to undertake the ascetic practices that strengthen virtuous qualities like fewness of wishes, contentment with solitude, self-effacement, and wholehearted effort. The Dutanga monk who lives and practices under the open sky is the perfect example of the homeless one, whose mind is constantly alert and earnestly focused on its primary objective, the transcendence of all suffering. Staying in a cremation ground is an ascetic practice that reminds a monk to be attentive to the fact that his body, too, will die and be cast aside one day. The Buddha encouraged monks to stay in cemeteries and cremation sites to promote the awareness that they themselves live each moment in the shadow of aging, sickness, and death. Camping at places where corpses are discarded to rot on the ground or to be cremated on a pyre of burning logs forces a Dutanga monk to be mindful that death can strike at any moment in any place, an awareness that arouses a sense of urgency in his practice. At the Buddha's time, corpses were customarily dumped in a charnel ground and left to slowly decompose while the rotting flesh was gnawed at by vultures, crows, dogs, and jackals. The pervasive stench of decay was overpowering. Eventually, the moldering remains were reduced to a skeleton, smeared with remnants of flesh and blood, and held together by withered tendons, until at last even the bones broke apart and turned to dust. Viewing this macabre spectacle and contemplating the grave and mortal reality of human existence, a forest monk enlists mindfulness and wisdom to probe, explore, and discover for himself the basic principles underlying the truth of life and death. Consequently, cemeteries have always offered monks an opportunity to develop a comprehensive knowledge and understanding of what it means to die. Arousing a feeling of urgency is a critical step forward on the Buddha's path to liberation. Practicing mindfulness of death with that urgency is a powerful means of paying the reality of death the attention it deserves and the respect it merits without hesitation or delay. Practiced thoughtfully, it produces an acute awareness of the fragile nature of human life which is expressed as a deep feeling of shock and dismay accompanied by a comprehension that life does not last forever and that efforts to overcome the fear of dying must be accelerated accordingly. Contentment with any lodging assigned is a Dutanga practice that fosters a monk's contentment with whatever lodging is available, regardless of its condition or location. In a forest monastery, a member of the community is usually chosen to assign dwellings to permanent residents and visiting monks, often using the status of seniority as a determining factor. A monk who observes the ascetic practice of being content with any lodging will not make any requests or state any preferences. He will simply accept the accommodation arranged for him. Neither will he hint nor suggest that another monk be moved to accommodate him, even if that monk is his junior. He will gratefully accept, without reservation, the dwelling assigned to him, and in the process close the door to greed and envy, actions befitting a disciple of the Buddha. The sitter's practice of not lying down is the last of the thirteen ascetic observances, 
and one that exemplifies the intense nature of the Dutangas. The monk who chooses to adopt this challenging practice agrees to spend the entire day and night using only three postures, sitting, standing, and walking without ever lying down. Even when a monk is overcome by drowsiness, any naps he takes must be confined to these three postures. A Dutanga monk undertaking this practice strictly should sit free of all back support or other aids that would help keep his body upright. Practicing a less strict version, a monk is allowed to lean against a post or a wall to ease the strain on his back, but he should never rest in a reclining position. A vow may be taken to continue this practice for a single day or for many days in a row, even up to spending the entire three-month rains retreat in only three postures without lying down to sleep, as I myself have frequently done. The sitter's practice is excellent for getting rid of sloth and torpor and laziness of all kinds, including the pleasure derived from lounging about idly or lying comfortably to sleep. Forgoing lying down gives a monk a lot more time to practice meditation. Its main purpose is to arouse increased energy to fight through the hindrances experienced in night-long meditation efforts. A John Mond strongly believed that the observance of Dutanga practices exemplified the true spirit of the forest monk's way of life. He strictly adhered to many of these ascetic practices throughout his life and always urged his disciples to adopt them in their own practice. While I lived and practiced with Ajahn Mon, he constantly stressed the value of using these austere methods in training. He sang the praises of living in remote wilderness areas, places that were isolated and frightening. For example, at the foot of a tree, high in the mountains, in caves, under overhanging rocks, and in cemeteries. We were taught to consider our daily alms round a solemn duty and advised to refuse food offered after we returned. He insisted that we eat all food mixed together in our bowls and avoid eating from other containers. And he exhibited a peerless standard of austerity by eating only one meal each day until the very last day of his life. As for me, I have practiced four Dutangas my whole monastic life without fail. Wearing only the three principal robes, walking on alms round every day, eating food only from the alms bowl, and eating only one meal a day. Apart from these four, I also undertook other Dutanga practices from time to time. As I mentioned earlier, I spent an entire rains retreat observing the sitter's practice. The other Dutanga observance that I've practiced most often is living in wilderness areas remote from places of human habitation. True to the character of a forest ascetic, I retreated from social interaction and kept to myself in the peace and quiet of forested recesses, which the village and townsfolk viewed with such a sense of fear and dread that they dared not come to disturb me. During my younger years, when I had more strength and energy, I'd trek alone into Thailand's vast wilderness areas, searching for secluded places to hang my umbrella tent and meditate uninterrupted by the sights and sounds of public life. I sought out remote sites in impenetrable jungle terrain and camped under overhanging cliffs on craggy rock faces in the mountains, places where even local hill tribe people found it hard to follow me. I lived in solitude without concern for my life or fear for prolonged hardship, practicing the Dutanga way of life to the best of my ability.